All right, so we are back in the book of Jeremiah. If you have your Bibles in advance, please turn there. Jeremiah chapter seven. We're not gonna complete the chapter, but we're gonna take another chunk from where we left off a few weeks ago. Hey, by the way, download the app because it's in these types of moments where you can turn to the app and look at the exact notes that would typically show up on the screen as well as any media that we want you to see. And I have two pictures that I intended to show tonight within the message. Now I'll talk through the pictures, but you can still see them by going to the notes section in the app. Jeremiah chapter seven. If you recall, one of the more famous quotes is in Jeremiah seven that Jesus said in the gospels about the temple. The temple was supposed to be a house of prayer, right? A house of praise, a house of purity where God would meet his people. That was the intention of the temple. God would meet his people in a structure. And then Jesus said, you've turned it into a den of thieves. A den or a place of comfort, a refuge of sorts. It's where they would go to find isolation. After their thievery, after robbing somebody, they would go to a secluded location, a den of thieves. And that's what Jesus called the temple. They had turned it into a marketplace. They were fleecing the people. They were supposed to be feeding the people and yet they were manipulating the people. And when you think about the temple in Jesus's day, transition your mind into what the church is in our day. But it's not a structure physically, the church is a people and your body is the temple. So when we come together, we're not at church, we are the church. And I can say God forbid because God forbid in his word, it's what he forbids that we would ever make this place of people a den of thieves where spiritual thieves and spiritual liars perpetually can find comfort in the seats when there should be conviction. Does that make sense? I love the quote because whatever you've come in with, the word of God will either convict those that are comfortable, I need to be moved out of my comfort zone, so convict me, Lord, or the word of God will comfort those who are afflicted. You're down and out. The word of God will meet you where you're at. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Here's the intention of being God's own special people. What's the mission? Here's the mission. That you would proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, that's the DNA of the church. When we come together, we come together to learn scripture, to praise our God, and then beyond the building, proclaim the praises of the one who took us from the kingdom of darkness and thrusted us or translated us into the kingdom of light. That's the church's role in a dark world. And it's only gonna get darker. The question would be, what is God up to in these days? What is he requiring of me as a Christian, as a believer, as a, his disciple? What is the role of the church at large in the community and society where that local church is planted? One thing that the Israelites in Jeremiah's day abused and misused was God's grace. The same grace that was extended to the nation of Israel, same grace shed upon a people the difference would be the timeline of the Messiah. Their entire system was built upon the expectation of the coming Messiah. Their, all, their sacrifices pointed to that the Messiah would come. The difference is Messiah has come. And all the sacrifices and the system that was pointing to him finds fulfillment in Jesus. So we don't live a life that has to constantly come to the altar and re-sacrifice, Jesus is the sacrifice. But if I truly believe that Christ died on the cross for my sin, 
all of my sin and his grace falls on my life, then there's no way I can leave the seats and live a life that disgraces God's grace. Those two just cannot be reconciled one to another. That if I truly believe his grace is good, and yet I leave and recklessly sin perpetually, habitually, and then claim, yeah, but God's grace is greater. If it was, then why am I, why am I not appreciating it? So what did the Israelites do that we often do? Well, they turned something beautiful into something gross. They turned God's beautiful grace into something gross. At their time, in that timeline, they would come to the temple and they would sacrifice for their sins. And then they would leave the temple and sin sacrificially, recklessly. And the argument was, well, we just sacrificed. We just tithed. We just, we're at church. Like I'm good with God. And then I would go live however I wanted. But there's a huge difference between being religious and being righteous. There's a lot of religious people in our world. Where are the righteous people? Where are the redeemed? Where are those who are willing to take a stand on truth? Unwilling to compromise. I believe the past several years have been extremely exposing. I believe like Jeremiah chapter six tells us, God placed a stumbling block before his people. Now, why would he do such a thing? He placed a stumbling block before his people because they claimed to be religious and yet God was gonna show them their blindness. And stumbling blocks come in various forms. Individually, different things I struggle with that I trip over, that God wants me to get back up, come back to him for fresh forgiveness, be charged by his grace, and again, imperfectly execute my Christian walk. That's like the cycle. But collectively and corporately for the church, there's these world events that are stumbling blocks that show us what we actually believe. From 2020 to today, there have been plenty of stumbling blocks to choose from that revealed the priority of the church. It's interesting, cool Christianity is no longer a thing if you haven't recognized yet. Like before the pandemic, BC, before coronavirus, there was like this strong movement in America, whether it was built on the prosperity gospel or the psychology gospel or the progressive gospel. It was like a cool thing to be a Christian. We were hip and we looked like the world and we had amazing concerts as our worship and the pastor wore skinny jeans and he told good jokes and he was able to kind of draw a crowd and like, well, guess what happened? COVID happened, and then Black Lives Matter happened, and then the contention of an election happened, and then the argument over masks happened, and then whether or not you're gonna get vaxxed happened, and all of these things threw people off in such a way, and the entire church went on tilt. And what God was doing was purging his bride to say, I wanna be the priority of your heart, so here's a stumbling block to see where you land on the other side. Remember, as Jeremiah is hearing from God and he's communicating both prophecy and judgment, he looks out into the community and he sees injustice everywhere, every layer of society embedded with sin and evil. And they were still going to the temple. So God sends Jeremiah to the temple in the beginning of chapter seven. And he says, Tell the people that are going to the temple how off they are. Can you imagine that? Standing in the foyer and a preacher is telling you, repent. You're like, what, what, what is this? What type of place is this? This is Jeremiah's mission. You get through about 15 verses and verse 16 tells you something stunning. Therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. 
How bad does it have to be that God says to Jeremiah, stop praying for them. Stop interceding on their behalf. I'm not hearing you anymore. They've crossed a line. Judgment was not only looming, judgment was coming. And the choice tool of judgment, as we know, was the Babylonians. Remember, I don't know that point of no return. I think we could be very close. I think any time that we subject children, the innocent minds of children to such filth, and not only affirm it, but legislate it, I think we're crossing a line. Adults, one thing, to make certain decisions, but when we subject the least of these, the little ones, I don't know how much longer God can tolerate such evil. So I don't know where we're at. And here's the complication. Should I stop praying for my land? Should I stop praying for the people around me? I don't know. This is the struggle as a Christian. So I kind of want to put it all together and say, sometimes you're supposed to pray for God to relent. Pray for mercy. That's like the season you're in. You pray, God, have mercy. God, relent. Sometimes he'll transition you to pray for the people to repent. It's messages about repentance. It's about turning back, returning to the Lord. And there's a season of that. Sometimes it's a season where God is like, no, no, no. Don't ask me to change my mind and don't even tell the people to repent anymore. Now prepare your people for judgment. I don't know where we're at. I stay up late at night trying to go, Lord, where are we? What's the message? Would you relent? Will you repent? Should we prepare for national judgment? Remember, one of those signs was given to us in Jeremiah chapter one. It was a phrase that we gloss over. It was the enemy's thrones are going to be in your gates. And if you remember, the gates were the place where legislation and policy and the affairs of a community were discussed. It's where the judges would meet in the gates. So if the enemy's thrones are gonna take the place of Israel's thrones, then what just was transferred there? Well, it's very simple. God says, if you don't want me in the public space, I will give you godless leaders in my place. So the Babylonians would literally come in to Jerusalem and establish their godless government upon a people, look at me, whose name Israel means governed by God. Don't let that sad irony evade you. They were a people whose name meant governed by God. And God is saying, you've pushed me so far out of every system. I'm going to allow a godless people to establish your government. What does that look like? Oh man, I can give you countless examples, color commentary. There's too many to choose from. Some more absurd than others. None more absurd than this one whether it's the governance of a schoolhouse or the governance of the White House. Recently in Vermont, a high school decided to not only subject the females, the women's volleyball team, to a boy who claims to be a girl, so he's allowed to join the team, okay. But then he goes into the locker room where many of the girls were uncomfortable because he, he wasn't changing as he was allowed to do he was just watching. So the girls complained to the administration and said, we just feel uncomfortable. Like we, we don't have a problem with being on the team. We know he's a transgender. We just feel uncomfortable. Interestingly, high school girls feel uncomfortable dressing around each other. You know what the administration did? They told the girls that they could no longer go to their locker room and allowed the transgender athlete to be able to go in there and then threatened the young girls saying that they're being bullies. And we shake our heads, right? We go, unbelievable. 
I'm going, how does it get to that far in any given state where there's not parents or men who are willing to stand up and go, "Uh uh-uh, you're not letting a boy in the locker room when my daughter is about to undress, and I'm not going anywhere until y'all figure that out. But what are we to do? Here we go. As the church of Jesus Christ, you continue to do this one thing. You continue to judge righteously while recognizing the signs of judgment nationally. You recognize the signs of judgment that are happening around us, while at the same time, you don't stop making the proper estimations or appraisals or judgments on what's happening. It's discerning the times, the signs of the times, and judging righteously, which has me living righteously, which has me talking righteously. Remember, nations rise or fall based on whether or not they follow God's law. God begins to speak again to Jeremiah. He gives some more commentary on why he's saying to the prophet, stop praying for them. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, follow this, watch. The fathers kindle the fire and the women knead dough to make cakes, underline this, For the queen of heaven, they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Okay, stop, full stop, actually. Did you see what God said? He's saying it's a family affair. It's a family affair as they're having a spiritual affair against the one true God. The children, of course, have the wood. The father is kindling the fire. The women are kneading the dough as they do what? As they make cakes or burn incense to the queen of heaven. Who is this queen of heaven? Can't just keep reading. I have to stop and I have to do a deep dive and and ask myself, who's this queen of heaven that they're willing to cheat on God with? Well, you discover this title, the queen of heaven, has its roots in the Babylonian culture, which is interesting because if the Babylonian people are about to come, what do they know about their culture? Well, this is the interesting part is that the Babylonian people have their roots in what is called Babel. So that's, all the way back in Genesis 11. And the Tower of Babel was spearheaded by a man named Nimrod. Nimrod, his name means rebel. There's a lot of teachings on what he was building with the people and God saw and said, I'm gonna scatter it. I'm gonna bring confusion to it because they're trying to make a name for themselves. It's false unity. It's false diversity. It's false uh, equality. It's false inclusivity. Like it's all false because it's not built on truth. Nimrod is said to have had a wife named Semiramis. Now, some of this is mythology, fables, or legends. And as time has gone on, each culture has told their stories differently. But here's where it gets interesting. After Semiramis dies, a myth is birthed about her life. That when she lived, she became pregnant from a virgin birth. And who she was carrying was the deceased husband of hers, Nimrod, but now she's having him as her child and she gives him a new name, Tamu. This is where it gets weird. And Semiramis took on the title of queen of heaven and her son was known as the son of God. And they told this story from culture to culture, that in the Mesopotamian cultures, Assyria, Babylon, they eventually changed their name to Ishtar. Ishtar was known as the goddess of sex and war and fertility. Ishtar is said to have had a son that was deified, known as the son of God. Ishtar's names were also the Virgin, the Holy Virgin, the Virgin Mother. 
Ishtar was the wife of Baal or Moloch, which are two gods in the Bible. When you follow Ishtar into the next culture, her name changes. It's just repackaged. Aphrodite in the Grecian culture, God of love. Venus in the Roman culture. All of them hold the title Queen of Heaven. Eventually, the Israelites called her Asherah, which is in the Bible, Asheroth. Same exact goddess, just repackaged and told a different way. What happens is that a man named Constantine in the third century eventually paganized Christianity to make it a more popular or palatable experience for the people. It is the origin of what we call a state church or what is known as the Roman Catholic Church. Let me pause and say, as I know many people in this room's background may be Roman Catholicism. My very own parents came out of Roman Catholicism. My mom was about to be a nun. That's how deeply <laughs> involved she was. So I don't mean to be offensive. I do intend to tread lightly, but I am also mandated to tread biblically here. Christianity became paganized. It became acceptable to all the people in the kingdom of Rome at the time in the third century out of the many pagan practices that were adopted in that time that prostituted Christianity in the name of unity and diversity. One of those practices has continued wildly to this day and it's a global phenomenon and it was the veneration or worship of the mother of Jesus who holds titles such as the Virgin Mother, the Holy Mother, the Queen of Heaven. So I'm just saying, out of all the titles to choose, why would they pull the queen of heaven from Jeremiah 7, which is related to pagan worship? So as we know, Mary is adored, and rightfully so. Now, the pictures that I've placed in your app, you'll be able to see. One is a picture of Samaramis and her son Tammuz, and the other one is a picture of Mary as depicted in many cathedrals holding her son, Jesus. The similarities are alarming. One, there is no biblical basis to pray to a saint or to the virgin mother. All right, and if there was then at the perfect time, Jesus is being set up to give us details about his very own mom. It would be in Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, to which Jesus is teaching and he's interrupted. As he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, ready? Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. Amen. Amen. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Because if that was something Jesus wanted us to know, that's the perfect question. Blessed is the womb, your mom? Blessed are the breasts, your mom? To which he should have said, yes, blessed, the queen of heaven but he didn't. What we have to understand is that even Mary, the chosen vessel to birth the physical Christ, would have to come to a place in her faith walk where she would make her very own physical son her spiritual God and savior. That repentance would have to hit her heart and mind just as everyone else. That does not diminish her role on earth. In fact, as she birthed the physical Christ, you've birthed the spiritual Christ. That was the whole purpose of that illustration, that she would bring forth the physical God in the flesh so that one day we could receive the spiritual God in Christ in our spirit. 
See, if worship, just as in Jeremiah 7, isn't tied to Christ, then it's anti-Christ. Any worship that does not find its vehicle in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, for his honor, for his glory, is anti-Christ, which means in place of. Mariology or Marian apparitions that have shown up globally, it's a phenomenon where people are traveling all over the world in order to see these apparitions of the Queen of Heaven. There are churches that are called Mary Queen of Heaven. And again, I'm just simply saying, if I knew the origin of the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah 7, I would certainly not use that title to describe the Holy Mother. I guess what I'm trying to get at is there is no Queen of Heaven to the King of Heaven. Not in the Israelites' culture and not in our day and culture. God would say to them, as he would say to even the Roman Catholic Church or any Christian by name, any denomination that is not worshiping him in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth, he would say, do they provoke me to anger? Verse 19, do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, here it is, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place, on man, on beast, on the trees of the field, on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. God is saying, this is to their shame. To which Daniel, who reaps the consequences of the Babylonian captivity, says a prayer where he actually takes this line and applies it to himself. That's what humility would do. And he says, shame on us, shame of faces on us that we would ever let a culture get this far. Did you know the word culture is the word cultivate? You get the culture that you cultivate. So if our culture has gone to hell, it's because we've cultivated it. It's because we've allowed it to be cultivated in that direction. So I would say the church's posture, one, Lord, would you relent? Would you give us a little bit more time? Would there be a window of grace? Is there a change that's upon us? Will this next election cycle yield a different outcome? But even if it does, God is interested in the saving of the soul and that the truth of the gospel needs to be front and center in every church. So we say, God, relent. And we pray, God, would we go first as we repent, but we also know the times and be prepared for what's coming ahead, which leads me to the next point. If I'm to continue judging righteously, as I recognize the signs of judgment nationally, I'm also to continue living righteously while being under judgment nationally, like Daniel. Just like Daniel, just like Esther, just like Mordecai, continue to live righteously regardless of what's happening nationally. Verses 21 to 23, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I, do not speak, for I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you. Notice that final line. If you follow my commandments, it will be well with you. But there's several things that occurred here. He's saying, hey, with your burnt offerings, eat the meat as well. The burnt offering was the only sacrifice that consumed everything. So God's like, you might as well just eat the meat with it because you're wasting the food and you're not following my commandments anyway. Like you're following something that I didn't even give to your forefathers until after they understood obedience. You're sacrificing, yet you're not obeying me. 
God is saying, hey, remember when I took your forefathers from the land of Egypt slavery? I set them free. I didn't then give them a system of sacrifice. I gave them my law. I gave them my commandments because I wanted them to follow me because I wanted to be their God. And I wanted them to be my people, my special possession so that it would be well with them. And what did they do? They gravitated towards the outwards, the externals, the work-based, the dues for God, which completely disgraces the done of God. Jesus said something very similar, just as harsh to the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus to the Pharisees in Matthew 23 about following the law, but completely missing God's heart. And he says to them in Matthew 23, 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. These are, these are incenses, these are fragrances, right? So they would divide them up if they had a hundred pieces of incense, they would, they would tithe a tenth of what they had. And it was very meticulous. They would actually have to, they were like the size of rice and they would go through it and they would, they would give back to God exactly what God said they should give. And Jesus like, yeah, you're doing all that. You're, you're macroing on the micro, but this is what he said next. And you've neglected the weightier matters of the law justice, mercy, faith, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he, he wasn't just, he wasn't condemning what they were doing. It was actually admirable how meticulous they were with what God asked them to do. He's like, but, but you missed the weightier matter. It's like you're there, and, and I've always said it, like there's so many people that can be so close to the scriptures they can dot the I, they can cross the T. They know chapter and verse. They can debate theology with the best of them. One inch from the scripture and yet one mile from the savior. And it's a theme throughout the Bible. God is like, I'm not interested in your sacrifice. I'm not interested in your tithes. I'm not interested in your church attendance. I'm not interested in your list of good works, your charitable causes. God's like, I want your hearts. I want obedience. I want you to follow my word so it would be well with your soul. God goes through such great lengths to literally throw off the religious order that was keeping people from his heart. Hebrews 10 is your homework assignment. Just read the entire chapter. It's, it's amazing. You eventually get to this statement that is said by the Messiah. And it's in light of God not wanting sacrifices and offerings. And it's as if Jesus, he stands on the precipice of eternity. And they're looking out, and I'm, I'm adding color commentary. This is not in the Bible, but this is how I read it. I read it, and then I, I bump into this verse. And Jesus looks out on the horizon, and he sees a people who were still worshiping, but they were so far from God. And they were sacrificing, and they were finding the lamb without blemish, and they were going through all these very intensive processes. And Jesus steps up, and he goes, sacrifice is not what you want, huh, Father? but a body you have prepared for me. And then Jesus enters into humanity and becomes the ultimate and final sacrifice. In that same chapter, the prophecy that he would come in the volume of the book that was spoken of him. It's like they were reading about this coming Messiah and there Jesus was in their midst the fulfillment of everything their hearts longed for. And what does sinful humanity do? We hang him on a tree, right? There, there is what sinful humanity is made of, all of us. And yet God allowed it. 
and God would redeem humanity through it. So sacrifice, that stress is due, will keep you from obedience that confesses done. Ladies and gentlemen, what Christ has done on that cross once and for all, paid your sin debt completely, entirely, in full. There's nothing left. That sacrifice was suffice. Jesus paid it all. It does not mean that I don't live a life of living sacrifice, but I'm no longer working my way into God's favor because that would never allow me to get to heaven. Instead, God came down and did the work I could never do. And then it's in that work fulfilled and finished that I find my rest. Now it's a joy to live a life of sacrifice because I'm not doing it to get something from God. I'm doing it because God has done something for me. And there is a huge difference between the two. I don't give to Lauren and Alejandro because I have to. I give because I want to. I don't give to the church because I have to because God's gonna give me a blessing. No, I give because I wanna give what is already yours, God, back to you. So I wanna steward well everything the Lord has entrusted to me. I wanna commit it back to God for his glory. And of course, that allows me to have a loose grip on everything in my life, including something that's very hard to take my grips off of, the people that I love. Right? Parents, a spouse, children. I'm a father now. I have no idea how parents are able to navigate the loss of a child. I don't think it's possible without faith in Christ, number one. Also not possible without wrestling with this thought. God, that child was yours before it was mine. no matter what touches the believer's life, because of what Christ accomplished on that cross, because he said it is finished, no matter what has touched my life or your life, God did not blink. He did not turn his back on you. I haven't said that in a while, but I, I think somebody needs to hear it. If it's touched your life, It had to pass through the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves you. You might not understand why, because we're still in this broken world, but he is good and he is faithful and he loves his church and he is purging his bride and there might be pain in the process, but we're gonna come out on the other side refined and more useful for God's business on earth for his glory. Verses 24 to 26, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. That's always how it goes. When you follow the evil dictates of your own heart, you might think you're moving forward, but you're really just going backwards. And it's interesting because there's these mantras nowadays, especially even in the church, the American church, that's like, just follow your heart. Just follow your destiny. And that's wrong. Because Proverbs 3, 5 tells me where I orient my heart. I don't trust my heart as Lord. I trust the Lord with all my heart. If I trust my heart as Lord, Jeremiah chapter 17 is gonna tell us your heart is wicked. Your, Your heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't even know the wickedness of your own heart. And God's like, but I do. So don't follow your heart, follow me with all your heart. These people, no matter the warnings that came, and watch, God warns, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt, he keeps going back to this line of demarcation, this this point of liberty where he freed them from slavery. He keeps going back there to say, guys, I'm the God 
who came down to deliver you from slavery and tyranny. I've done that already. And now you're living on your own inclinations. He goes, ever since then, I've sent you my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. God is sending his messengers today. And, and globally, they're, they're all saying the same thing. These messengers are preparing the church for the days ahead. And if we don't wake up now, if we don't wake up to it, and the it is a lot, we will not wake up from it. This is not a game. What is happening in our land is gonna have consequences on generations to come. And the church has been sleeping at the wheel. I don't know where we're at, I can kind of conjecture it's called the cycle of democracy, but, but it applies. There's like a template when you go, oh my gosh, that's exactly what Israel went through. They started out off in bondage as slaves, so slavery, and then God gave them liberty, and it was in the liberty stage where they were free to bite the hand that freed them. And then liberty, too much liberty, and not protecting it, because there's always boundaries with liberty, right? You tell me to walk out onto my balcony, too much liberty, and I'm gonna transgress the boundaries that are there to keep me safe. But I'm free where I'm at. Well, liberty eventually rolls over to gluttony. A land of gluttony. Access to anything I want at the tip of my fingers. Gluttony produces complacency. Complacency is the most dangerous place to be, right? But I'm still coming to church. I'm sitting in the comfortable seats. I'm, you know, I'm good with God, right? Complacency always rolls over to apathy. Now I'm desensitized. Oh my goodness. Some of you in this room know something as simple as a minor cuss word that was censored, so that did not enter into your television. And when it did, the culture of the land was in an uproar, just for one word in a movie, Gone with the Wind. People were like, whoa, you just subjected our children to hearing the word damn. Now it's like, oh. Well. Taking my kid to the library for a drag queen's story hour. What, you got a problem with that? We've become so desensitized, so numb to the evil and the filth. And the church has always justified and said, you know what, as long as we're in our little Christian bubble, right? Because the Bible says I'm just passing through here, and this is not my home, and that's true. This is not an excuse not to be salt and light. And I'll tell you what happens. Apathy rolls back over to slavery. Where are we at in that? Because God's like, hey, remember when I set you free from slavery, liberty, and then I took you through the, the wilderness, and you lost sight of me, and you got filled with gluttony and then your gluttony made you complacent and your complacency made you apathetic and I kept sending my prophets and, and sending warning and you kept killing the prophets and now your apath apathy has rolled over to dependency and now you're back in slavery because here come the Babylonians. Here's the funnest part, verse 27 as we close. Therefore, Jeremiah, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. How fun does that sound? But that's not just like the prophet's role. 
Because the Christian is mandated to speak truth and share the gospel, even if it's offensive. And the Christian is commissioned to lead with truth and not affirm a lie. And the sad reality is, no one's gonna listen to you. People are no longer gonna respond to you. If they do, it's gonna be, you're just a bigot, you're a sexist, you're a racist, you're just intolerant. You need to get with the times. I wonder if that is enough to silence the Christian who has the greatest message that this world desperately needs. Jeremiah, even though he's told they're not gonna listen to you, when you, we're gonna get into some of his journals, like he's struggling. I can only imagine he's out there in the public square and he's, he's preaching what God put in his heart to preach and they're not responding. In fact, they're mocking him and they're jeering him and they're slandering him and they are literally turning on him. And I bet you when he would get to the private chambers of his home, he's just wrestling, going, why am I doing this? Nobody's listening. And then Jeremiah chapter 20, verse nine, which is one of, one of my life verses. It says, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back and I could not. He was like the fire of the word of God was so much stronger than the voices of the critics and the haters. And I knew that in the midst or multitude of naysayers, maybe just one would respond to the message of the gospel. And that's the one that God needed to reach. So are you willing to take the blows and like Jeremiah, know that they probably will not obey you and they will not respond to you. But if the word of God is in your bones, like a fire that's shut up, then it's time to unleash it. So the third point that I want you to get, if I'm to continue to judge righteously, make the right determinations while recognizing the signs of judgment nationally, okay, I see what's happening here. I'm still gonna appraise any given situation as good or evil as the Holy Spirit allows me. I'm also gonna continue to live righteously while reaping the consequences of judgment nationally. So nothing's gonna change from this day until the next time that consequences fall. I'm gonna continue to speak truth. And the final point, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue to speak righteously regardless of being judged wrongly, okay? This is hard, trust me. Even a message tonight where I, I kind of took us from the title Queen of Heaven and started to address the present title of Mary and the Roman Catholic Church, the Queen of Heaven, like that's not a popular message. But I am mandated to continue to speak righteously regardless if somebody is gonna judge me wrongly. My heart is that we would come to know, and here's the most practical application, that each of us would come to know the real Christ. The real Christ. And be a part of the real church. Just wanna see how awkward it could get. <laughs> how am I doing on time? You don't care? You got school tomorrow? What did I talk about tonight? Just give me one thing. Kelly's telling him. You know what we're gonna do? And I, you know, my team's gonna kill me for this, but the hour's late. Um, we're not gonna have a final song, okay? I wanna spend a, a moment just praying because I don't know where we're at. I don't know if it's God relent. God, we need to repent. God, prepare my heart for what's ahead. Like, I don't, I don't know. The spirit usually will give us the discernment to know the difference. So let's just take this moment, the few minutes to just pray.
Can we just pray? Can, you, can, can some of you, if you feel so inclined, can you come up to the altar? Like Dominic, if you feel comfortable. I, I would, don't, don't do anything you don't wanna do, but this is the posture that the Lord is asking me to share with you right now. This is not planned. If you wanna just come up here on, on this altar, we're just gonna pray for our land. We're gonna pray for the elections ahead. We're gonna pray for the church to get back to the work the Lord has for us. If there's anybody in here that does not know this Jesus I speak of, I want you to come up here too. If the Lord is pressing upon your heart to give your life to Christ, come up here. Don't put this off. Don't, don't wait. This ain't, this ain't a performance. I'm, I, I might have a microphone on, but that's so the people in the back can hear me. I'm not interested in playing church. This is great and all, right, that we have lights and cameras in action. It's great that we get to put technology on the screen. I mean, this is all a blessing, but we don't need any of this. We don't need any of this to be the true church of Jesus Christ. He does not need any of this to save a soul. What he's asking his church to do is pray, that we would take prayer seriously, that you would remove anything in your heart and mind right now that is keeping you from God. He is calling his people back to himself. He is begging his people to return before it's too late. Judgment, as we read about it in his word, it's all the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Just because we're in a different epic or a different age, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you would wanna come up here right now and pray with us, I appreciate the faithfulness of those that got out of their seats. I'd appreciate the faithfulness of those in their seats. Let's pray. God, we are sorry. We're sorry for what we've made this. We are sorry for turning this into a performance or a show, making this robotic, making this more about the religious aspect of it. As long as we're here and we're singing our three songs and we're getting a sermon and then we're high-fiving on the way out, we're a part of a club, like, God, forgive us. Allow us to just come undone and worship you for who you are in spirit and in truth, to know that you are real and you speak through your word and you are purging your church. Forgive us from our sins, fresh and anew. Give us the moral fortitude and courage to stand on the gospel, to reach out to lost loved ones and friends and just ask where they're at with Jesus. The time is short. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. God, I pray a special blanket of comfort upon those in this place who have lost loved ones recently. They miss them. I pray that you would fill that void, that you would allow your grace to meet them in their grief. I pray for anyone in this place that has a physical ailment. Holy Spirit, would you, would you heal? Would you do what only you could do? Would you draw that individual closer to yourself through the affliction? God, I pray for our leaders, our country. I pray for the president. You command us in your word to pray for our leaders, kings, governors. So I pray for, for all of them. God, would you persuade them? Would the decisions they make be righteous and not unrighteous? Would your church play a part in all of this? Would we be on a holy mission, on fire, to save more, one more soul? Because at the end of this day, nothing matters except for that. This whole thing is burning up. I can't bring a single possession with me. On that day, nothing will matter except what I did in your name for your glory. So Holy Spirit, just impress upon your people here and now You're doing a work here. 
We trust you for the outcome. We commit the days ahead to you. And God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.